Okay, so today we're going to be um, assembling the uh, separator assembly for a 100 EACM, and this is a, a direct drive design, so the separator shaft is going to be uh, coupled with a flexible coupling to the, to the drive motor in a vertical manner. So we're going to start by installing the lower bearing, which is closest to the uh, end cover near the separator wheel. Now, these bearings are still for light bearings, and they're identical in size. So the upper and lower bearings are, are the same, okay? But uh, for the purposes of this demonstration, we're only going to be heating the lower one uh, before, before we insert the, uh, the shaft into the bearing housing. So I've already um, set up the separator shaft in a manner in a vertical manner where it can't move so that it's straight so that when I um, heat this bearing to 200 degrees Fahrenheit on the inner race using the induction heater that I'm going to have a straight drop until the bearing shoulders itself, okay? The um, other thing to remember is to make sure that the, the, the surfaces of the, the shaft and the bearing journal are clean and when we remove the bearing from, from the pack we also wipe it down too to make sure there's no, you know, anything that might hinder us from getting it on or create any any problems during the assembly process. As with the um, the rotor assembly, these bearings are regular ball bearings, sealed for life. They're not uh, directional, so you can install them either way, and it's not going to make a difference. I'm going to use my um, my temperature indicating crayon again because of these sealed bearings and the uh, con the contact seal that is uh, supplied with them. I don't want to overheat this bearing, so 200 degrees Fahrenheit is about the maximum temperature that I want to um, heat this bearing up to for uh, different reasons. I don't want to compromise the seal, and I don't want it to degrade the grease. And if, so if the grease uh, breaks down and starts to leak out, the bearing's no good and we would have to use another bearing. So it's, it's very important to monitor and make sure that you, as soon as this temperature crayon melts on the bearing, that you install it immediately. And don't overheat the bearing as well. So I typically mark the bearing on the inner race before I start to make sure that there's a visible mark using the crayon before I turn on the heater. And I also make sure that I have my temperature gloves ready because the, the, the heat up time for this bearing could be um, fairly rapid with uh, this type of induction heater. You know, this bearing might heat up in under two minutes, you know. So I want to be ready so that as soon as it's hot enough, I can put it on and not burn my hands using my gloves. My crayon's melting now when I touch the bearing, so it's to 200 degrees Fahrenheit. So we're gonna turn it off and install the bearing right away. We have a special tool that we use that puts even force on the inner race and the outer race so that it goes down smoothly and doesn't get, doesn't get cocked if you put on even pressure. Once the bearing's seated, you see there's a, a groove machined in the shaft for a retaining ring that we put on afterwards to prevent the bearing from moving along the shaft and make sure that it stays, you know, on its shoulder. Now, typically, these, um, you know, when these are when these are brand new, they're very tight. You see it snaps right in and it's always a good idea to check to make sure that it's fully seated in the groove so that the bearing can't move. For this type of, of um, retaining ring I like to use the um, snap ring pliers that are 90 degree angle so that you can work on the outside you know. 
but you'll know when it's fully seated in the groove because the whole snap ring can actually spin in the groove. See how it's, it's not getting stuck. I can pull it with the pliers and it'll actually rotate because it's, it's already in the groove. And it's not gonna pop out. So at this point, the next, the next step is to uh, install the shaft into the bearing housing, okay? Because this bearing is going to be the, the shoulder bearing in the housing. So, but in order to do that, I, because I used heat to apply this bearing, I want to let it cool for a few minutes so that it goes smooth, smoothly into the bearing housing. Now we've inverted the bearing housing so that the lower bearing is going to be shouldered inside the housing. So now we're going to install the shaft through the housing so that this bearing seats itself against the shoulder on the inside of the housing. It's very important to make sure that you have enough space below the housing so that the, uh, the end of the shaft where you would uh, put the coupling doesn't make contact with anything that prevents you from dropping it straight in. Now the bearing's fully seated. The next step is to install the end cover to shoulder the outer race of that bearing because this is your shoulder bearing. The end cover has three holes, 120 degrees apart, so it doesn't matter which way you put it on as long as that you have the holes aligned with the holes on the bearing housing. get the hardware. This particular assembly uses um, a uh, socket head cap screw. There's counter boards in the end cover to mount those. And it's a um, quarter inch, 20 thread per inch by one, one quarter inch long socket head cap screw. Now that the lower bearing is shouldered, we're going to invert the bearing housing and install the upper bearing. Now this, this bearing, the upper bearing, doesn't have any real load on it. The main function of this bearing is just to maintain the centering of the shaft within the bearing housing. So we're not going to heat this bearing to put it on the shaft, but we're going to use our special tool which fits inside the bearing housing but maintains even pressure across the face of the bearing on both the inner and the outer race. So we're going to basically tap this bearing onto the shaft and into the housing at the same time until it's shouldered on the shaft. I've gotten the bearing you know, as straight as I possibly can by hand. I'm going to use our special tool to drive it the rest of the way in.
this point I've bottomed out the end cover. So now I'm going to loosen all the bolts and remove the end cover and install the snap ring. The bearing should be at the proper location now on the shaft and inside the housing. As you can see, now the bearing is shouldered and the snap ring glued that's machined into the shaft for the retaining ring is, is, is apparent. Now I can install the snap ring to make sure that the bearing doesn't move up along the shaft during operation. There. Now you know the tabs are fully inserted, the tabs closed together. Now you, the snap ring is you know, fully, fully installed. Now we'll reinstall our end cover to shoulder. Against the housing, we install our hardware. As mentioned, the same hardware is used on the end covers, both the top and bottom, one and one quarter inch long, one quarter 20 socket head cap screws. Eight foot pounds of torque should be applied evenly to all three. And then finally we install our flingers. Now the flingers are basically um, used to prevent material from getting into the bearing housing assembly. The flingers will be secured with two set screws each to the shaft so that at rotation speed it prevents um, material from getting inside the housing that could possibly contaminate the bearings or attack the seal material on the bearings. When you install the flingers you want them to make contact with the end cover and then raise them approximately 1 32nd of an inch and secure them evenly with the set screws so that they are even and do not make contact during rotation with the end cover. So the final step for the assembly is to install the lower flinger. Now we have the bearing housing inverted so you can see where the separator wheel would shoulder. Okay. Also important to note to always keep the, um, the jam nuts for the separator wheel on the end of the shaft to protect the threads during the assembly process. These are left-handed thread uh, nuts because of the direction of rotation of the separator wheel at speed. This, that forces the jam nuts to tighten against the separator wheel to prevent it from coming loose during operation. Flinger should make contact with the end cover, okay? And as you can't see in there, and there's no way, you basically raise 1 32nd of an inch and gently tighten the set screws and check by rotating the shaft to make sure that there's no contact between the flinger and the end cover. And as also mentioned before, the whole purpose of these flingers is to prevent material that's being processed from getting into the bearing housing and damaging the bearings. As you can see, I rotate the shaft and there's no audible noise or signs of interference between the flinger and the end cover. So at this point, the assembly is complete.